Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. I am Saurabh Sharma, Assistant Professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bengaluru. We are doing Introduction to Chinese Studies. We shall uh, do some lectures on China's foreign policy, beginning with the 17th lecture on China in the Cold War. Now, uh, China's foreign policy has evolved over time. So when, when I mean China here, I mean the People's Republic of China, the, the China ruled by the Communist Party. Now if you look at the evolution of its foreign policy, we can find that there are different stages of uh, this evolution. So I have divided it into six stages for the purpose of uh, the lectures. Uh, the first stage is from 1949 to 1960, that is from the foundation of the People's Republic of China to the rift between Soviet Union and the People's Republic. So this period has been named as leaning on one side. The next period is from 1960 to 1971. This is a period beginning with the Sino-Soviet split and most of the events during this period are influenced by this particular split. Then uh, from 1971 to 1989, we have the pe period of rapprochement, beginning with the rapprochement with the United States and uh, gradually China taking the help of United States in order to counter the threat from the Soviet Union and eventually reaching a rapprochement with the Soviet Union towards the end of this period in 1989. Next we have 1989. 89 to 2004, this is a period of high capabilities and bite time. Uh, next is 2004 to 2013, peaceful development or harmonious world. And 2013 to 2023, that is great power projection. The last three I am going to discuss in the next lecture. So in this particular lecture, China in the Cold War, we are going to just cover the period of the Cold War, that is from 1949 to 19. 89. Let us begin. So first uh, let me give you an overview of the foreign policy leadership of China at that time. So the paramount leader of, of uh, China of course was Mao Zedong. So Mao Zedong he was the paramount leader. So obviously he played the most important role in making of the foreign policy. He uh, in this period was the leader of the party that is the party chairman and also leader of the state that is the state chairman. Uh, the later position he relinquished to Liu Shaoqi in 1958 but uh, still Liu Shaoqi did not really play a major role in foreign policy. His focus was mostly on the economic sector. So the main foreign policy leader that the person who actually ran the day-to-day -day foreign policy activities, meeting with world leaders, you know, participating in important conference was Zhou Enlai. Zhou Enlai was the premier of China since his founding and he also used to be the foreign minister till 1958. So in 1958, he gave up his post of foreign minister to Chen Yi, okay, who remained uh, the foreign minister from 1958 to 1972. But he again did not play an important role uh, because of his criticisms of Mao's policy. Just like Liu Shaoqi, he also was persecuted during the Cultural Revolution and that, that began in 1966. And therefore, uh, the main two main leaders of China's foreign policy were Mao and Zhou. Now, important role was played by the military, People's Liberation Army. 
So the leadership of the People's Liberation Army was also very important in deciding on foreign policy. So let me name some of the prominent figures. Chuta. Uh, Chuta was a comrade of Mao who helped Mao to emerge as the leader in the Communist Party and also helped in the victory in the civil war because he was the commander in chief of the People's Liberation Army from 1946 that is from the beginning of the civil war. Once the Chinese constitution of 1954 came into being, the post of commander in chief was abolished and he served in various capacities in the, within the Chinese government leadership and he was also consulted in foreign policy. So along with Mao Zedong and uh, Zhou Enlai, Chu Te also played an important role in foreign policy. Then another important personality is Feng Te Wai. Feng Te Wai was an important military leader along with uh, Lin Piao. Okay, all of these leaders dressed in this uniform, these are, these are actually among the 10 marshals of the People's Republic of China. You can see even Chen Yi is one of the marshals. Okay, these, are, these, these people held the highest position in the Chinese military. So, Chu Te was the oldest among the 10 marshals. These, these pictures were taken in 1955, while Lin Piao was the youngest of them. Now, uh, Feng To Wai played a very important role in the Korean War because he was the commander of the People's Volunteer Army that participated in the Korean War uh, that fought against the United Nations forces led by the United States. After the war, he, he was made the Defense Minister of China. So he served in this capacity from 1954 to 1959. But uh, in 1959, he went on to criticize Mao Zedong in the Lushan Conference because of the Great Leap Forward. And therefore, Mao targeted him and he was removed from all his positions. And later he was persecuted in the culture revolution. And, 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 and so, so he played an important role for almost a decade of, of uh, uh, China's foreign policy. But after that, he was sidelined. He was replaced as the defense minister by Lin Piao. He became the new favorite of Mao. Lin Piao played an important role because he went on to become the number two in 1969, the designated successor of Mao, uh, but uh, he was removed from power in 1971 uh, when Mao began to distrust him and he decided to uh, remove Mao from power in a military coup which failed and then he had to escape with his family but his aeroplane crashed in Mongolia okay, and he died. So he played an important role till 1971. Okay, so this was the foreign policy leadership of China during the initial years. So let's look at some of the events that took place. So China began its, its journey in foreign policy with uh, these policies. Okay, number one, leaning on one side. Now this was a product of, uh, uh, of the policies of Sun Yat-sen. So Sun Yat-sen was the leader of the Kuomintang and the uh, Republic of China in 1923. He formed an alliance with the Soviet Union and the Communist Party of China. And uh, so uh, among the policies advocated by him was that China should ally with the Soviet Union because it was a more reliable ally than the Western countries. And this idea was developed by Mao in uh, what, is, what was known as three new principles of the people. So Sun Yat-sen had given three principles of the people. Uh, these were nationalism, democracy and people's livelihood, which to which uh, Mao said, um, uh, Mao added three new. These were the three great policies or which uh, later he called uh, the three new principles of the people. That is uh, alliance with the Soviet Union, alliance with the, with the Communist Party, and support to the peasants and the workers. And so leaning on one side was part of that policy. So when uh, the Communist Party came to power, 
uh, in th this was a period of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. And uh, Mao declared that China could not remain neutral in this uh, conflict because the Soviet Union had held the Communist Party to come to power. So it was necessary for them to lean on one side and Soviet Union in return would help China to develop economically, militarily and so on. And in the Korean War, of course, uh, this played an important, Soviet support played an important role. And before that, of course, in the Civil War, because without the help of the Soviet Union, the Communist Party would never have come to power. So he leaned on the side of the Soviet Union. And this policy continued for some time. Uh, Stalin died in 1953. After that, uh, in 1956, the new leader, Nikita Khrushchev, he criticized Stalin in a party conference. And then this became known to the other communist leaders. And this created certain problems because uh, Stalinism was one of the important principles that many of the communist parties believed in. And now the de-Stalinization process basically meant that the lead, respective leaders of different communist countries, had, they were worried about their own legacy, whether their own successors would in turn remove their uh, 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 achievements from the uh, records of the uh, history. And, and so this rift eventually went uh, increased more and more and uh, the policies of Mao began to deviate from the Soviet model. And that eventually led to a complete rift between the two, the Communist Party of China and the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. We shall get to it in the next slide. The next important policy was cleaning the house before inviting the guests. So once a Communist Party came to power, they closed down all the foreign, uh, foreign uh, legations that were present in in, in China. So, of course, Japan was the occupying force and Japan was, the Japan surrendered and they had to withdraw from China. But there were other colonial powers like the British, the French and the Americans who had certain rights, extraterritorial rights within the Chinese territory. This was part of the unequal treaties or the century of humiliation. So, Communist Party or Mao was insistent that the western countries or the colonial powers had to withdraw completely from China before coming back to establish uh, diplomatic relations based on equal treaties. So the unequal treaties had to go and the equal treaties had to come. So the cleaning the house means removing the unequal treaties and the various colonial possessions of uh, the western powers and inviting the guests means once the house had been cleaned the colonial powers or the said western powers could return return based on equal rights of nations and establish diplomatic relations then the third important policy of this time was setting up a separate kitchen now china had been divided into two so the communist party came to power in the mainland of china but the island of taiwan and the uh, and the and the neighboring islands were under the possession of Kuomintang under Chiang Kai-shek and this was known as the Republic of China which was the government before the People's Republic was formed. So the, gov uh, the, the earlier government of China migrated to this island of Taiwan. So setting up a separate kitchen meant that China would have relations with only those countries which de-recognize the Republic of China. So you could not recognize both the Republic of China as well as People's Republic of China. You had to choose one of them. So many important countries chose the People's Republic of China, Soviet Union, India, even Britain, France went on to recognize the People's Republic of China when they realized that uh, the Communist Party was there for good. They had become victorious. But some other countries, for example, the United States, kept on supporting the Republic of China because Chiang Kai-shek was their old ally and they backed the Republic of China. In fact, Republic of China held the permanent seat in the United Nations Security Council until 1971. So therefore, I have mentioned from 1949 to 1971 because once 
China was recognized by most of the countries and it became a permanent, I mean the People's Republic became the permanent member of, of the Security Council. Uh, basically, the separate kitchen had been successfully set up and now it was only a matter of time uh, when, uh, when Taiwan would lose its recognition internationally and eventually it would merge back with the motherland, that is the Chinese thinking. So these were the three important policies which Mao enunciated at the very inception of the People's Republic of China. Then began the Korean War. So uh, Korea had been occupied by uh, Japan uh, from, uh, from 1895 onwards. And uh, in 1910, they outrightly annexed Korea and declared it to be Japanese territory. But uh, when they were defeated in the Second World War, uh, Korea was occupied by the Allied forces, the northern part by the Soviet Union and the southern part by the United States and the Western Allies. So the, 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 the two occupations were divided by the 38 parallel north latitude. And uh, they went on to establish their own preferred forms of, of government in these two parts. The northern part came to be known as Democratic People's Republic of Korea or North Korea, which was a communist dictatorship under uh, Kim Il-sung. And the southern part was a capitalist dictatorship supported by the uh, United States and it was under Sigmund Rhee. Now in the Cold War, the Soviet policy was to expand the influence of communism and the policy of United States was to contain communism. So they were working on opposite direction. So in, in, in Korea, Kim Il-sung had built a strong army and uh, with the encouragement of the Soviet Union, they crossed the 38 parallel in order to capture South Korea. So this is the beginning of the uh, Korean War and, and, and the communists were successful. They drove uh, uh, the South Korean forces south and that eventually led to a United Nations Security Council resolution against North Korea condemning it because at that time Soviet Union was boycotting the, the UN Security Council on the matter of China's membership, People's Republic of China's membership of the Security Council. As a result, it could not exercise the veto power. And so the United Nations condemned North Korea and it ordered a United Nations force to, to be sent to South Korea to liberate it from North uh, Korean occupation. And uh, General MacArthur, who was the, the leader of the American forces there, led the United Nations forces. And so when United Nations intervened, they defeated the North Koreans and pushed them beyond the 38th parallel. And MacArthur believed that he could defeat communism completely and, and drive out uh, the communists from the Korean peninsula and perhaps cross the Yellow River, which is the boundary between China and North Korea, and even liberate China from the communists. And so these are just fanciful. Uh, idea, so I am not sure if the, uh, there was any uh, legitimate uh, uh, consideration of these ideas, but, but these are part of the uh, thinking, part of this containment strategy in order to defeat communism. So China, which was supporting North Korea from the very beginning with, with uh, Chinese volunteer uh, uh, force or Chinese volunteer army, because they wanted to separate the People's Liberation Army, which is the official uh, military of the Chinese state, uh, uh, they wanted to separate that official military from this particular volunteer force uh, so that they could not be blamed for aggression by the United Nations. But obviously, uh, Feng Tuhai was uh, in involved in this and, and uh, most, of, most of the people fighting there were part of People's Liberation Army, just the change of name. 
But when uh, the United Nations forces re reached the Yalu River, there was waves after waves of, of these uh, Chinese forces that began to enter Korean Peninsula. And the overwhelming numbers of the Chinese forces basically drove back the United Nations forces. And they were driven south of the 38th parallel. And uh, for a few years, uh, there was a bit moving a bit forward, going backward, this thing go, went on. Ultimately, there was an armistice in, in 1953. And 38th parallel was the, became a kind of a de facto boundary between the North and South Korea. So, so this whole idea of China intervening in Korea was described by Cho and Lai as if lips are gone, then the teeth will be cold. So, if Korea is gone, if, if, if the capitalist powers capture Korea, then, then China would be open to aggression. Okay, so till North Korea is there, North Korea is like a like lips which, which will protect the Chinese teeth from, from foreign aggression. Therefore, it is necessary to protect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of North Korea. Even at the cost of complete uh, liberation or, or reunification of China. The case in point was Taiwan because by entering the Korean War, basically the Chinese made Americans into enemies and, uh, and, and so America would, would uh, then play a more proactive role in supporting Taiwan or the Republic of China. So even at that cost, China decided to protect uh, North Korea. Okay, so Korean War was a very important part of China's foreign policy at that time. So also was the Indochina War. Indochina Peninsula is basically an area in uh, a geographical area in in uh, Southeast Asia, consisting of today's Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Now this was colonized by France. It used to be French colony which was occupied by the Japanese during the Second World War. But once the Japanese left, then the France reclaimed these territories. But uh, they had their own uh, nationalist movements and uh, especially led by the Communist Party of Vietnam and so uh, whose leader was Ho Chi Minh. And so they opposed the French and there was a war between the, between the communist guerrillas and the, and the French forces in which uh, basically uh, China supported North Korea and uh, in 1954 there was a treaty in which France gave up its claims over Indochina and uh, Korea uh, and Vietnam just like Korea was divided into North Vietnam and South Vietnam. North Vietnam was communist led by Ho Chi Minh and the Communist Party and South Vietnam was capitalist supported by America and other other powers. Now I have already discussed in details India-China relations and so in the in the 50s basically China was trying to develop friendly relations with India with Hindi Chini, Bhai Bhai and uh, Panchashil. I have already discussed in details all this. China also took the advantage of India's influence and, and in India's first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru's influence in the world to uh, form better relations with countries of Asia and Africa. So, they participated in the, uh, the Bandung conference. So, Zhou Enlai, the Chinese premier participated in this conference and in this conference, there was a statement of solidarity between African and Asian countries. So, this was the 1950s for China. Then the next decade, which was defined by the Sino-Soviet split, we have uh, Soviet Union withdrawing its uh, advisors and blueprints and, uh, and the projects that they were doing, they completely withdrew everything from China suddenly in 1960. So, uh, uh, a rift that was uh, growing between the two in the, since the mid 50s eventually led to complete withdrawal of Soviet support from China. Then uh, re China's relations with India also deteriorated on the border question and, and Tibet and so Chinese invaded India and so the relation with India also got 
spoiled and soviet union after the the war because uh, during the war soviet union was busy with the cuban missile crisis and so in case it had a war with us it needed chinese support and and therefore it did not condemn china during the 1962 uh, sino indian war but after the war the soviet union gradually started shifting its support towards support towards india now uh, china was threatened from the south with india now becoming an enemy of china with with america ready to help india in the north china was threatened by the soviet union which was a superpower and so china decided to follow a policy of third worldism basically improve its relations with the third world continue the uh, bandung spirit and so it it signed border agreements with burma nepal and pakistan very quickly at the at the time when it was fighting with india and to improve relations with with africa the african countries uh, cho and lai from 1963 to 1964 traveled to 10 different african countries and supported them in various ways and improve china's relations with these countries okay so there was a basically a competition between india and china for the leadership of the newly emerging third world countries and so china tried to secure its relations with these countries uh, by giving some concessions giving them support so on and so forth they also developed nuclear deterrence so in on 16th of october 1964 China conducted its first atomic test at Lopnur okay so China became a nuclear weapons power thus ensuring that there was deterrence so in case there is a war with India or Soviet Union they could threaten them with a nuclear bomb on the other hand the split in the in the communist international communist movement led China to become closer with Al- Albania so the leader of Albania Anwar Hoza Anwar Hoza. He was a critic of the Soviets. After the death of Stalin, he said that the the new leadership of the Soviet Union, led by Khrushchev, had become revisionist. Okay, they had denounced Stalinism, and they were trying to develop better relations with Marshal Tito and Yugoslavia. Now, Albania was. a uh, sort of a rival with yugoslavia and so although it was a part of the Wa- warsaw pact in the uh, beginning with the early 1960s it has stopped participating in the meetings and by 1968 it withdrew its name from the warsaw pact and china was also having its rift with the soviet union so both of them came together there there was a mutual admiration between mao and Anwar Hoza and so this was a bright spot in China's diplomatic relations because no other communist party was willing to support them perhaps you can say north korea was neutral it would neither sided with soviet union nor with with china same with vietnam not vietnam uh, but albania was the only communist ally of the of the people's republic of china now in 1964 america intervened in 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 uh, vietnam because the communists were trying to overthrow the southern vietnamese government there was a viet cong which was the communist party of southern vietnam and they were trying to overthrow the government there so america decided to intervene because they believed in the uh, dominoes theory that if vietnam fell then so will other southeast asian countries and so they decided to militarily intervene and uh, china began to help north korea and also ha- allow the soviet union to help them so uh, supplies came from the soviet union which went through chinese territory into northern vietnam so there was a communist cooperation in order to counter american aggression although the relation between the two soviet union and china had deteriorated but uh, still to help in order to help north vietnam against us they were together in fact the the relation reached a point of conflict when in 1969 there was a short border conflict in in an island in the usuri river which is in the 
uh, northeastern part of, uh, of of China, which is basically uh, Manchuria region of China. So there was a border conflict with the Soviet Union, with various reports of of how many people or uh, soldiers died in that. But uh, Chinese felt that this was a very serious issue, and China was was afraid that the Soviet superpower could run over them, and so they started looking for different alternatives in order to protect them from the Soviet Union. This was the warning sign. And so that led to the next phase in China's foreign policy, the rapprochement with the United States, which began in 1971 with the ping pong diplomacy. The ping pong diplomacy, ping pong basically means table tennis. So the American table tennis team was, was competing in, in, in Japan and so was the Chinese team. And uh, one of the American players, he traveled on the in the Chinese bus. I won't go into details, but basically, uh, the team was then sent to China. So the Americans agreed to send the American table tennis team into China, and some messages were exchanged. And this eventually led to uh, the secret visit to China of Henry Kissinger, and and Pakistan basically facilitated this secret visit. So Henry Kissinger was on a tour of different countries. He came to India, then he went to Pakistan where he became sick and he, he went to rest in the mountains and there the Chinese came and took him to China where he met with the Chinese leaders and that paved the way for the American President Richard Nixon visiting China early in 1972. Now with improving relations with US, China also got the permanent membership of the United Nations Security Council, I mean People's Republic of China. Republic of China led by Chiang Kai-shek was a permanent member and America was stopping People's Republic from getting that seat. Although Soviet Union and India which, were both, which had both become enemies of, of China practically, they supported China's membership. But now with improvement of relations with US after the secret visit, America did not try to stop the inclusion of China in the UN Security Council. Although they suggested some alternative solutions in terms of China getting, getting the permanent membership while Taiwan remaining a member of UN. But China was following this setting up a separate kitchen which eventually came to be known as the One China Policy in the Shanghai communique between uh, Nixon and Zhou Enlai when he visited China. So this is one China policy. So uh, America agreed to this in the Shanghai communique. So although America recognized the Republic of China had diplomatic relations with them and not with Beijing. Uh, so, so they had diplomatic relations with Taipei instead of Beijing. But in this communique they agreed that there is but one China and Taiwan is a part of China and peaceful settlement of the Taiwan question should be done by the Chinese people that America won't intervene in the conflict between Taiwan and the People's Republic of China. And, and the Chinese as asserted in this communique that they won't accept one China one Taiwan or one China two governments or two Chinas or any form of independent Taiwan or the status of Taiwan being ambiguous and the Americans had to agree that Taiwan was a part of China. Taiwan could not be separate from China in any way. So this is a major development in China's foreign policy. And so China basically became victorious in this competition with, with uh, Taiwan and became a permanent member of UN Security Council as well as got the support of United States to its one China policy. At that time, the Taiwanese government that is Chiang Kai-shek's government also followed a one China policy. But their claim was they were the legitimate rulers of China. So they were not the rulers of Taiwan. So Republic of China, were, the territory of the Republic of China was not Taiwan but the entire territory of, of China. So in that sense, there was uh, the same approach of the two governments. Anyhow, so uh, in 1974, Mao Zedong and uh, later Tang Xiaoping 
enunciated this, this theory of three worlds. Now there is already a, a, a French theory of the three worlds, the first world, second world and third world. The first world being the liberal democratic West and second world being the communist Soviet Union and its allies and the third world being the neutral countries, the countries which neither were fully capitalist nor fully communist. Uh, but this, this third world theory was a bit different from that theory. Uh, this is a uniquely Chinese theory. So the argument was the three worlds were number one, the first world, the two superpowers. So both US and USSR were imperialist powers. So US was an imperialist power and Soviet Union was a social imperialist power. Okay, and, and both wanted to dominate the world. Okay, they did not believe in, in the freedoms of the people. So both were a threat to the world. And they basically had their allies in the second world. Second world were the remainder of the, of the global north, which included uh, European countries. So the Western European belonging to the, uh, to the American uh, camp, while the Eastern European countries belonging to the Soviet camp. Besides that, uh, Canada, Australia, Japan, all these developed countries, they were all part of the second world. So they either sided with the, with the Soviet Union or they sided with the United States. And then the rest of the world was the third world, which included Latin America, Africa and uh, Asian countries, including China. And China wanted to present itself as the leader of the third world. It always tried to give a bad name to India and they called uh, uh, the Indians basically a B team of the Western uh, imperialist powers. And, and of course, after 1971, the B team of the Soviet Union. Okay, so only China had the had the intention to support the third world and so they should be considered the leader of the third world. So this was the three worlds theory proposed by Mao. Uh, but this led to worsening of relations between Albania and China. So Albania in the 60s was the only ally of China. But once uh, China improved its relations with the United States, Anwar uh, Hoza, he started moving away from China. He started criticizing China for uh, having relations with an imperialist power like the United States. And so Albania basically became isolated. They were opposed both to the Soviet Union as well as to United States and as well as to China, opposed to everyone. By 1976, the old leadership of the, the People's Republic had died. So the same year, in 1976, Chu Te, uh, Chou Enlai and Mao Zedong died. Uh, first Chou Enlai, then Chu Te, and then Mao Zedong. They all three great leaders of, of, of communist China died in the same year. And with this came the transformation of leadership. So we have a new leadership that emerged, the second generation leadership. Now the designated successor of Mao was Hua Kuofang who was not a very senior leader in the Communist Party before Mao noticed him and, and promoted him. Before that, he was, not a such, he was not such an important leader. And although he was, he held all the important positions of premier, party chairman, uh, chairman of the military commission, Tang Xiaoping, who was a veteran of the Communist Party, very influ influential in the in the Chinese military, People's Liberation Army, he started becoming more and more powerful. His, uh, he, he had been basically uh, persecuted in the Cultural Revolution and uh, the Gang of Four had been able to purge him just after the death of Chou Enlai uh, because a large number of people came in support of Chou Enlai after his death. And Mao was a bit jealous of, of Chou and, and Tang Xiaoping was considered a protege of Chou Enlai and therefore uh, he was purged for some time. But once Mao died, Hua Kuo Fang, he rehabilitated Tang Xiaoping. Uh, before that, he had to get rid of the gang of four, which included Mao's wife, uh, means uh, Mao's widow. And, and, and so for that, he received support of Ye Qianying, who was the defense minister of China from 75 to 78, another of the 10 marshals 
of, of the People's Republic of China. So with his help, Huo Kuofeng was able to arrest the Gang of Four and other supporters of the Cultural Revolution and the Cultural Revolution came to an end. In 1977, Tang Xiaoping's uh, positions were all returned to him and in the end of 1978, Tang Xiaoping became or emerged as the new paramount leader of China. So he was basically the force behind China's foreign policy at this time. Ye Chiang Ying, he had become old and he basically retired from, from, from the defense ministry in 1978, after which he did not really play any important role, although he held some important positions, but he was not very active. Now in terms of uh, those, the, the, the people who supported Tang Xiaoping in his, in his, uh, in his foreign policy, uh, Huang Hua was very important. Huang Hua was the foreign minister uh, of, of China, a veteran diplomat, uh, an expert in, 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 in diplomacy. Uh, he played an important role. He remained the foreign minister till 1982. I will mention something about him later. Then you have Su Chiang Chan who was the defense minister. Uh, he was made the defense minister uh, by Tang Xiaoping after uh, Ye Chiang Ning he retired, uh, Su Chiang Chan became the defense minister. Uh, who, he played an important role in the Vietnam War and in the consolidation of, of power of Tang Xiaoping in China. Then there were the two young protégés of, of Tang, Hu Yaopang and Chao Chiang. Okay, these are the two protégés. One uh, became the party chairman and later general secretary because the post of chairman was abolished in 1981. And uh, Chao Chiang, who was the premier for seven years till 1987. And then once uh, Hu Yaopang was removed or, or he was in fact purged in 1987, Chao Chiang, he replaced him as the general secretary. And Chao Chiang himself was purged in 1989. We are going to discuss that when we discuss the events. But so in the uh, late 70s and the 80s, these people played an important role in, in implementation and form formulation and implementation of China's foreign policy. So a lot of things happened. It's a long period of, of almost 20 years. The relations with the United States continued to improve. And so in 1979, 1st of January, a joint communique was released establishing diplomatic relations between the United States and People's Republic of China. So United States shifted its recognition from uh, Republic of China to the People's Republic of China. So this was after the death of Chiang Kai-shek who was the old friend of the Americans. So he had already died in 1975. And so United States decided to finally form relations with Beijing and US Embassy was opened there. Uh, and uh, they declared the government of the People's Republic of China as the sole legal government of China and Taiwan was a part of China. But there was some support for uh, Taiwan in, in, in the United States because Taiwan was a capitalist country, it used to have some elections also. It was not a democracy in a true sense, but eventually it, it became a democracy. But it was capitalist and it was pro-America. And so, uh, in the US Congress, Taiwan Relations Act was passed the same day. The same day that the joint communique was released, the Taiwan Relations Act was also passed. And Jimmy Carter was the American president, signed both of them. See, before Taiwan Relations Act, there was the Sino-American Mutual Defense Treaty. Okay, this was in uh, 1955. So, uh, after the end of the Korean War, uh, China decided to retake Taiwan and so in, in uh, 1954, they attacked Taiwan, they bombarded uh, the adjoining uh, islands. So uh, the Sino-American Mutual Defense Treaty was signed in 1955 in which America guaranteed that they will come in the defense of Taiwan in case there is an invasion from China. So China had in the, in the first uh, Taiwan Straits crisis, bombarded the islands of Kinmen and Matsu, uh, which, which are the first 
a line of defense of Taiwan. So, Taiwan has two lines of defense. One are the smaller islands of Kin, Kinmen and, and Matsu and then the main island of Taiwan. So, uh, the treaty said that US would come to the defense of Taiwan only if the main island and the islands further to the to the west attack, not in case of uh, Kinmen and Matsu. By that, the US was able to avoid uh, avoid uh, intervening in the first Taiwan Straits crisis. But with it basically was a warning to China, and 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 China had to stop its bombardment of the islands. Then in, in 1958, there was another uh, bombardment by China of the same islands. They were basically testing if US would come to the aid of Taiwan. But this also eventually passed off uh, because India, their relations with India were getting uh, worse and so uh, they eventually uh, launched an invasion of India. Now, uh, the mutual defense treaty came to an end in 1980. So, this was replaced or, or just before it, it expired, the Taiwan Relations Act was passed. Now, this was an assurance to Taiwan that America will not let Taiwan be invaded, but there was no guarantee in this particular act. This was passed by both houses of the Congress and signed by the US President, but it was short of a guarantee. It basically meant that US would continue supporting Taiwan. Now, uh, the relations between China and Vietnam had also worsened. So, now China had problems with Soviet Union, with India and also with Vietnam because Vietnam had uh, a few years before this invaded Cambodia which was uh, ruled by the Khmer Rouge who were uh, Maoist supported by China. So, the Vietnamese Communist Party attacked Cambodia, removed the Khmer Rouge from power and uh, established the rule of a pro-Vietnam communist faction. And basically, this whole Indochina, Cam Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam came under the control of Vietnam, and they became allies of the Soviet Union. Okay, so so China uh, did not like that, and uh, perhaps to teach uh, Vietnam a lesson, just like they taught a lesson to India, or uh, uh, because Tang Xiaoping was just. Uh, emerging as the leader and he wanted to assert his, his control over, over the military and, uh, and, and try to sideline Hua Kuo Fang. Whatever the reason it was, uh, they invaded Vietnam in 1979. But China, from all the accounts that we have, received a bloody nose. It was a, it was a very brutal war between the two. and. Uh, about uh, 60,000 or even more soldiers died in this particular war and almost equal numbers which was uh, a bad thing for China because the Vietnamese uh, were used to losing large numbers in order to defeat uh, bigger powers. So, they basically compensated larger number of casualties for the sake of victory and uh, China had to withdraw from Vietnamese territory. So, we can say that they were not able to achieve anything. Instead, they lost about 30,000 soldiers in this particular war. Whatever it was, Tang Xiaoping was able to consolidate his power and, and become more and more powerful within the Chinese state. Now, US was also basically in two minds. One, it wanted because of the Cold War, it wanted to bring China closer to it in order to counter the Soviet Union. On the other hand, it also wanted to protect Taiwan and so in 1982, Ro Ronald Reagan, the American president, he signed a third communique with, with China, which promised to stop long term arms supply to Taiwan. And as soon as this was done, there were some, some noises in America and Taiwan was given six assurances by America that although they agreed to stop uh, sales of arms. But there will be no date that will be announced, and America won't mediate or pressurize uh, Taiwan to uh, return to China, and there will be no discussion on the change of the the sovereign status of Taiwan. There will be no revision of the Taiwan Relations Act, 
and they won't have any consultations with Beijing before supplying weapons to Taiwan. So there were some assurances given to Taiwan. At the same time, there were some assurances given to China. So it was playing both sides. While China was trying to improve its relations with the Soviet Union. Okay, so uh, three uh, great Soviet leaders died within a period of uh, three years. So beginning with Leonid Brezhnev who died in uh, 1982, he was followed by Yuri Andropov who died in uh, 1984. These two occasions were used by the Chinese to promote what came to be known as funeral diplomacy. And uh, Wang Hua, the foreign minister, was sent to the, to the funeral of Brezhnev. But in that particular uh, occasion, he praised Brezhnev. He said that Brezhnev was committed to, in his life, committed to peace. And this was criticized in China and so he was fo forced to resign once he returned from the Soviet Union. The problem between China and, and Soviet Union was articulated by Tang Xiaoping in three obstacles. So there were three obstacles to good relations between the two powers. First was Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. So in 1979, Soviet forces had occupied Afghanistan. So they had to withdraw before good relations. Number two, Soviet Union after 1969 had, had uh, you know, stationed its forces on the Sino-Chinese borders, even in Mongolia, there were Soviet divisions, which were a threat to China from the north. And so, before good relations, these forces had to be withdrawn by the Soviets. And finally, the Soviets had to stop supporting the Vietnamese occupation of, of Cambodia. So, these were the three conditions put by the Chinese before good relations could be established between the two powers. Now, another important uh, dimension of China's foreign policy was getting back Hong Kong and, and Macau. Now, Macau was under the Portuguese occupation and Portuguese were willing to, once, once there was a revolution in uh, Portugal in 1974 and the fascist government uh, had been overthrown and, uh, you know, they tried to, after 74, they even recognized the liberation of Goa and all that. So the Portuguese were no longer willing to maintain their colonies and so they wanted to hand it over Macau to China but China stopped uh, that process because they wanted to settle Hong Kong first and once certain principles had been established in the case of Hong Kong, Macau could follow. And uh, you know the Hong Kong, basically this is Hong Kong, this entire thing. Now it has, it used to have three parts. The dark blue part is the island of Hong Kong with some smaller islands around it. Now this was annexed by the British in 1842 after the first opium war. So this was basically British territory, British colony, full fledged. Then in 1860 after the second opium war, the Chinese had to give up the Kowloon Peninsula. So this particular area had to be given up to to the British. So this was also annexed by the British. Then again in 1898, there was a convention of, of uh, Peking in which uh, the new territories were handed over to Northern Kowloon, the rest of the peninsula plus the new territories, these are the new territories, these, these were handed over to the British on a 99 year lease. So these territories were leased because you know, for water supply and for supplying the uh, Hong Kong, they needed these territories. So together, these three, Hong Kong, Kowloon and new territories were called Hong Kong. So once the lease expired in 1997, the new territories had any way to be handed over to the Chinese and Hong Kong would not be able to sustain without the new territories. And so the British entered into dialogue with the Chinese and in 1984, there was a joint declaration on the status of Hong Kong and it was decided that uh, Hong Kong would be returned to Chinese sovereignty on the 1st of July 1997 under one country, two systems policy for 50 years. That is, Hong Kong would become an integral part of China but there will be a special administrative region and the Communist Party won't rule 
Hong Kong, like the rest of China, there would be a multi-party democracy, there would be freedom of speech, freedom of religion, these are all part of the basic law. And eventually there would be a Chinese promise that there will be a multi-party democracy with universal adult suffrage and a democratic government in Hong Kong. 50 years passed from 1997, that is till 2047. And soon after this, in 1987, there was a joint declaration on Macau and Macau would be handed over by Portugal to China on 20th of December 1999, this was decided. Now, uh, China wanted it a bit earlier, they said they could do it together with Hong Kong, while Portugal wanted to postpone it a bit late to celebrate certain uh, uh, colonial achievements that they had, but uh, China said they won't accept a date after 2000, so this particular date was decided. And in these maps you can see the location of Hong Kong, this is Hong Kong here and this is Macau. So Hong Kong is a bit to the north and Macau is a bit to the south. This is the uh, Kwangtung province of, of China. So they are adjacent to the Kwangtung province. These are two special administrative regions of China which follow one country, two systems policy. Okay, so I will uh, stop here. Uh, so in the next lecture, we will go into uh, China's foreign policy after 1989. Uh, so, in this we have covered from the beginning of the formation of, of the People's Republic of China when it, it was on the side of the Soviet Union and gradually how there is a rift between the two and then uh, to the next period when it improved its relations with the United States and it became uh, practically an ally against the Soviet Union during the rest of the Cold War and how uh, the problems of Taiwan and Hong Kong and Macau were dealt uh, with by uh, China and uh, United States in case of Taiwan and China and Britain in case of Hong Kong and China and Portugal in the case of case of uh, Macau and uh, its improved relations with the United States actually helped China to reach agreement with these other countries because China was trusted um, trusted by the western countries in the 1980s. So thank you, we'll, we'll discuss the rest of the things in the next class. Hello, welcome to the 20 hour course on introduction to Chinese studies. I am Saurabh Sharma, assistant professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bengaluru. Before this, I was assistant professor of political science in the Rajiv Gandhi National University of Law, Punjab. I have studied Chinese studies from the center for East Asian Studies, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. I basically teach political science and international relations to undergraduate students. So this course offers you some basic ideas on China that I have learned over the years from teachers of Chinese studies as well as from my own experience interacting with Chinese scholars as well as visiting China. In this particular course, there, there are 20 lectures. You can see this is the list of the lectures that we have. Let me briefly go through this list. First lecture would be on the origins of Chinese civilization, in which I talk about where the Chinese civilization began, how it began, and what are the main ideas that constituted Chinese civilization. The second lecture is on a very important concept in Chinese political thought known as mandate of heaven. So this thought came about in the Chou dynasty period 
and that is about uh, 1000 BCE and since then each coming dynasty has used this concept in order to justify their own rule. Thank you.